Hello and welcome to the 21st annual exhibit of hydrogen and fuel cell technology. We have something unusual to offer right now, an hour of presentations on electrolyzers. So I'm warning you, you can't get up as of yet, you're stuck here, but the drinks are on the house, we'll be serving regularly, um, uh, so don't worry about dehydration. We're doing something called an elevator pitch. It's a rather unusual format, although people do it in business. Uh, you have to imagine you're on an elevator and as it stops in the floor, the doors open up and you see a potential customer there and you start yakking at him at the speed of light and you have about five minutes to convince him that your product is the best in the world and there's nothing other than that. Um, they do speed dating, this is the elevator pitch, it's rather similar. There's going to be seven speakers, one after the other. They each get five minutes, roughly five minutes, to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of electrolyzer technologies. I'm sure they'll be talking about the advantages. Why are electrolyzers important? They may disagree with me, but one take on this issue is that Germany itself has lots of renewable energy, and the question is, how do you store it? Well, of course, electrolyzers are famous technologies. They're more than 100 years old. You split the um, hydrogen, the, the water molecule, into hydrogen and oxygen, and the hydrogen is a wonderful source of energy that does not exist unless you use energy to produce it, but you can recover that energy. So it's part of the energy storage capacity that can alleviate the grid. We already produce too much wind energy, the grid can't absorb it. So that's one function that electrolyzers could perform in this modern energy economy. It's of course clean energy and it helps us to use renewables independent of the cycle of production. Whether the sun is shining or not, you can store the energy and recover it when you need it. So that's how important electrolyzers are. Maybe there's other functions we'll be discussing. I'm sure there will be. But we now have seven presentations, five minutes each. We're going to talk to the territory manager. That sounds very territorial. The territory manager of Proton Onsite, Raymond Schmidt. Please welcome with me Raymond Schmidt. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies Bye. and gentlemen. <laughs> So I have five minutes, I'm going to present you one of the most uh, major companies in this industry, uh, Proton on site. So we are a hundred employees uh, companies located in connected uh, to USA, but with a very large European uh, customer base. We are the leader in uh, PEM electrolysis, so Proton Exchange Membrane. And we have over uh, 20 years R&D and field experience. So I'm not going to make a, bit, a lot of talks, but just show you some projects, just to show how mature our company is. Uh, we are system going from uh, kilowatt to megawatt scale, so starting from one normal cubic meter up to 400 normal cubic meter an hour. So we can uh, offer system for all scopes and for all industries, uh, let it be in industrial or renewable applications. So we have over 2,500 units uh, installed worldwide. One of the projects, fueling in Germany. So we are focusing on reliability on our equipment. Another one would be wind to hydrogenic uh, project. Flexibility in our system so it's able to fluctuate and uh, cope with the fluctuation of renewable energies. High safety, we install our system also in, uh, in the, uh, for the Navy in submarines. Intermittent operation, we have installed also a system for uh, power to gas application in Germany. Another one for, would be for industrial, so availability of our system. It needs to run constantly. This is a case for metallurgy, for example. Another one would be for power plants, robustness of our equipment. It needs to last for a very long time. Continuous operation, another example. So instead of making unnecessary tools, you saw the pictures, you saw our uh, experience. So we have 20 years experience. We have a demonstrated technology installed worldwide in industrial and renewable applications and we have a strong field experience. So this is what is making us strong and our product attractive uh, on that market. So just come and visit us, uh, Hall 27, Booth uh, C70. Thank you. So thank you. Um, we have to pass the baton on, yeah. uh, rather like a marathon. Up next on stage is Tristan Kretschmer, who's sales manager in Germany for McPhy Energy. So, Tristan, welcome. Thank you. 
Well, yeah. Thanks for the introduction. My name is Tristan Kretschmer. I am responsible for the sales in Germany. Um, hydrogen, a new energy for our planet. This is our slogan. This is actually what we believe in uh, with McPhee. Uh, we are um, a European equipment supplier for, for hydrogen production and storage units. Uh, we sell fully integrated systems for the production and the storing of hydrogen. And, you know, there are a lot of um, different systems and technologies on the market, but we clearly believe that especially the alkaline electrolysis will be a key technology for the future hydrogen economy. So why is that? Um, we looked at the market and uh, we looked at the several technologies and we found out that the alkaline electrolysis is a well-known over decades known technology which is very mature but was a little bit of dusty. So what we did actually we got rid of the dust uh, and re-innovated it and made it a new product which we call alkaline 2.0. That means we are able to use this proven technology which has been proven um, on a large scale, even on a megawatt scale, and uh, reinvented is at this, as I said, Alkaline 2.0. Um, you can see two systems here on the, on the screen. One is a 0 0.5 uh, megawatt system that produces 100 normal cubic meters of hydrogen per hour, and it's mounted on a skid with a full balance of plant, which makes it easy to transport, easy to install. And if you want to scale up because the, the 100 normal cubic meters is not enough, we simply attach another stack. Pretty much the same for the system you see over here. This is a McLyzer 6012. This produces 60 normal cubic meters of hydrogen under 12 bar of pressure. And um, the idea of this system is that customers who have an, let's say, upscaling demand within the next years, they can start with smaller modules. We simply deliver the container and it's Maybe it just includes two or three of those uh, stack systems. So you can start with 20 normal cubic meters per hour. And once your demand increases, we simply add more stacks. That easy it is. Uh, it's a fully redundant system, which means you can run it 24 seven. And if one of those stacks breaks down or needs maintenance for whatever reason, we simply deattach it, we disconnect it, we get it out of the system, and the rest of the electrolyzer uh, stacks take care that the production unit is still 100%. So of course, uh, the modularity of the system um, is one key point which uh, we, we need to solve and which is one demand for, of the markets, but it's not the only one. Um, we need to optimize the efficiency. So what we did is we optimized the products for the current market requirements. So we increased the, uh, the efficiency itself. We are able to produce hydrogen with less than 4.9 kilowatt hours uh, per produced normal cubic meter. And we operate under high pressure. So we gain a pressure up to 45 bar in our system, which then can be used by the customer afterwards for any utilization you have. And of course, also the dynamics um, play a, a big role since we get more and more renewable energy in the grid. Um, those systems need to be um, better and better in the, in the dynamics. And we, start, uh, we, we are managing um, uh, dynamics from standby to the nominal production in 35 seconds and maybe less. So this is not the end of the road there. There's still um, space to, to innovate and to be better. But 35 seconds is the, um, the current standard. And um, we can operate those systems in a power range of 20 to 150 percent. And as you can see on the, on the diagram over there, um, what we tried once um, with our system uh, is to follow wind profiles, meaning we got an energy input which is similar to what a wind profile would be. And you can barely see it because the, the difference is so, so small. Um, we showed that the electrolyzer, the alkaline electrolyzers, is able to follow those wind profiles and only have a loss of 5% of the energy, which is quite good for, for, the, uh, for the market. And um, therefore, we think that uh, we are more than ready in the market for um, power to gas and power to fuel applications. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, up next. Hard to hold the card and talk at the same time. Uh, Dr. Graham Cooley, CEO of ITM Power. Welcome, Graham. Hi, thanks very much. 
Hello, my name is Graham Cooley. I'm the CEO of ITM Power. Uh, we're a company in Sheffield, 70 people, focused on um, electrolysis um, for a number of major markets. Um, so our interest is in power to gas energy storage and refueling stations. Um, so power to gas, first of all, is the use of um, rapid response electrolysis uh, to put hydrogen directly into the gas grid. We also make refueling stations um, for the new and emerging market of fuel cell electric vehicles. Um, our offering is rapid response electrolysis that's self-pressurizing. Uh, so we make electrolyzers that re can respond in less than two seconds all the way on and all the way off. That means they qualify for primary grid balancing, which is the highest tariff structure that you can achieve. They're also self-pressurizing, so we can match the pressure of the hydrogen to the point of the gas grid where we're injecting. That means you don't need a buffer store or a compressor. Uh, they're also very high efficiency. Um, uh, we regularly measure over 75%. Um, and also, we've just launched a one megawatt unit, so they're at the right scale for grid balancing and energy storage. Um, we recently um, um, had a strategic investment from JCB, just under five million. Uh, that investment is all about manufacturing. Um, these markets um, are now growing very, very quickly, and that means you have to be able to achieve volume. And our partner, has 22 factories uh, worldwide. This is one of their factories in India, which is over 100 acres in size. Um, our first major uh, power to gas project was with the Tuga Group. In, that's the largest grouping of power and gas utilities in Germany. Um, that first project qualified us for grid balancing in Germany. Um, as a direct follow-on of that project, we um, delivered a unit to RWE recently. Uh, these are uh, a third of a megawatt unit and 0.2 megawatt units. Uh, their first demonstrations of rapid response electrolysis for power to gas energy storage. And we delivered that unit in 10 weeks. Um, we have a major collaboration with National Grid in the UK. Uh, National Grid own the high voltage electricity network and also the high pressure gas grid in the UK. And we've done two projects jointly between us and Amec Foster Wheeler and we're um, in the process now of deploying some early units for power to gas in the UK. Um, so uh, uh, today and yesterday we've been launching our, our uh, one megawatt stack. You can see it on our stand which is uh, uh, just over uh, um, by the main walkway um, in the hydrogen area. Um, and that stack uh, combines all of those properties together. That is scale, high efficiency, rapid response and elevated pressure. And we have a slightly different business model to most electrolyzer companies. Uh, we build, own, and operate hydrogen refueling stations. Um, as you can see from this table, we're on our 11th hydrogen refueling station, including the two that we just recently announced in London. So we're now building five refueling stations in London. Very importantly, we announced a uh, collaboration with a global power and gas sorry, a global oil and gas company who retail fuel, and we are now putting the next three refueling stations on, on uh, petrol forecourts in London. Um, just to say something about the numbers, we've scaled up the electrolyzers to megawatt scale for cost reduction. Actually, the other thing that gives you cost reduction is volume. Um, so over the last two years, we've broadly speaking had a doubling in revenue, so 100% growth. Um, so there's the number in our broker's note for 2015, um, which is approaching six million in turnover. Um, and I can tell you that announced projects um, going forwards, just the collaborative projects, are now uh, approaching that six million for 2016 already. So with volume and with technology, you get cost reduction. Um, so uh, just to conclude then, we have, um, 
um, just over 8 million of contracted projects. Um, about another 7.5 million coming forwards, 15.5 million of projects, and that sort of volume leads to considerable cost reduction. Okay, thanks for listening. Thank you. Up next on the list is uh, Roel de Meyer from Hydrogenics. Passing on the microphone. Where is he? Hydrogenics. Did he sneak, sneak off? Would you be willing to jump on the stage then? Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Mauro Gregori, sales manager for CTS Energy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am a sales manager for CTS Energy, a company located in northern Italy that developed since uh, uh, five years ago new, uh, new technology concerning hydrogen. In these years, uh, uh, we have been... Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. We have been uh, thinking about uh, applications of uh, hydrogen and we were thinking uh, that uh, uh, we would like to reach uh, all the potential market for all the applications as hydrogen applies to all potential electrical applications. So the real question was uh, which is uh, the way to storage the energy and the way to produce our own energy. And we thought about uh, uh, self-generation uh, um, on site and uh, micro distribution localized. That means uh, I can today with the technologies build my own uh, hydrogen and today also I am able to make it in small, in small uh, scale in the way that uh, uh, I can concentrate a lot of energy in a small, uh, in a small volume and that's why our company has developed uh, a ultralight high pressure uh, cylinder composite uh, technology which uh, today reaches up to 300 bar pressure and uh, uh, moreover uh, we have seen that uh, after the development uh, the application are really many applications starting from uh, aerospace application, electrical mobilities, raging standards, and so on. Uh, the product uh, that uh, is developed uh, is developed also in uh, place, uh, in, um, developed in order to be placed into a machine that is a dispenser, which is, uh, in terms of uh, um, techniques, is an electrolyzer, which today allow anyone to get uh, their own production and their own storage and their own mobility of the hydrogen in the, in the, in the, um, in, uh, for the application. So inside the, the, the dispenser, uh, there are an, a bunch of uh, cylinders, high pressure cylinders. And uh, this, the dispenser uses uh, uh, PV uh, electrical energy or windmill electrical energy. So the idea of the company from the uh, owner Mr. Cremonese Roberto was uh, for, since uh, years ago the beginning to use only and especially uh, green uh, uh, solutions. So the idea came uh, to this product that is a plug-in product. Today you can come to our company, you can purchase finally a finite product which is uh, scaled in, uh, in uh, production. What we would like to do is to reach uh, the most number of customers in order to increase our uh, bunch of uh, production, lot of size uh, of production, in order to decrease on more and more costs. And this application works for everything. Moreover, we have uh, um, a patent system, uh, um, and patent pending system, sorry, for battery storage uh, for house application. This is a, f a further step. So after the production, we can also reuse our own hydrogen 
and uh, use it in the market of the battery storage, what uh, you can easily find made today by lithium-ion uh, technology can be uh, most, uh, uh, more ef uh, effective, cost-effective in terms of time with a technology based on hydrogen. So today we can uh, then uh, respond to the request of the need of the, of the um, carrying the hydrogen and the energy with uh, concentration of energy in a small uh, volume, a distribution of uh, the energy through a distributor which is also a self-producer of uh, hydrogen ready and ready to plug in and uh, as a system which makes uh, independent the owner of a house or the owner of a small company to be uh, independent from the electrical net that's it thanks a lot thank you um, our client has returned, so I can reintroduce Roel de Meyer, who's from Hydrogenics, um, joining us on the stage. He almost snuck away again, but he's back. <laughs> okay. Uh, Roel de Meyer, Hydrogenics, welcome. There are the buttons. Good afternoon, everybody. So, my name is Roel de Meijer from the company Hydrogenics. We are located in Belgium and in Canada. Um, I brought with me some pictures on the plant in Belgium. So here you see part of our manufacturing premises. So what we do is, well obviously, otherwise I would not be here, we're building electrolyzers. There are some few other screenshots. This, al this picture already reveals what it's about for the insiders on the, uh, among you. This is a alkaline electrolyzer. It's the smallest uh, type we built today. It has a power intake of about 60 kilowatts and a capacity of 10 normal cubic meters per hour. Now, most of the time, we built our systems containerized. Let's say 70 to 80 percent of our business is a fully integrated containerized unit. Some other screenshots over here. The systems on itself, alkaline electrolysis, basically we talk about either PEM or alkaline. This is all alkaline. It's all built around these alkaline cell stacks, which is for us a standard defined product, a 15 normal cubic meter stack. The stack itself, the core, uh, the, the core components, we source them from other suppliers, but they are all designed by us. Uh, there's one exception, we also make the membrane ourselves. Here's a screenshot. It's an inorganic membrane. In the past, asbestos was used to separate hydrogen and oxygen. Here you see a typical system. It's actually the system we sell the most. It features four such stacks. That's a 300 kilowatt system give or take, 60 normal cubic meters per hour. Now, that was an electrolyzer. We call it, in our internal dialect, we call this a process part. You also need an AC-DC power supply. You need to get to DC current for electrolysis. You also need a control panel. You need to operate a plant, typically dealt with by PLC, uh, with PLC technology. Screenshot, it's a dashboard of the system. Um, designed by engineers, obviously. Around a system, there are other components needed. Often forgotten, but typically people will need purifiers. You want to get high quality hydrogen. That means hydrogen coming out of electrolysis will be wet, saturated with water, and will typically contain still a little bit of oxygen. It's parasitary electrolysis that occurs. This device will purify the hydrogen to a large extent. You will get figures in the range of 99.999%. You, you have some other peripheral equipment. Unfortunately, the system needs cooling. You need clean water. You need demineralized water. You, you don't go in with tap water. You need to really uh, make up uh, high quality water. Now, most of our customers well, 
they don't want to know all this. They actually uh, ask us where is the hydrogen coming in, uh, where, where is the, the power coming in, where is the water uh, coming in, and where is the hydrogen going out. So we pre-integrate systems, we build them in containers to make it easy for the customers to install them on site. Which, again, appears to be a winning strategy because most of the customers prefer to have containerized systems. A few words about customers. We've been delivering systems over the past 16, 17 years. We have an install base of about 350 systems, a variety of systems, uh, mainly industrial applications, but also um, in the fueling and renewable energy, which we are talking about today, of course. A few field examples, pictures of containers. Who is excited? Um, we have tons of such pictures. This is an indoor unit. We have uh, installed, let's say, about 50, 60 systems like this, all inside a building. Larger plants, note that you have a high degree of um, um, redundancy on this plant because you have eight identical systems. This produces 500 normal cubic meters per hour which roughly equates to a power intake of two and a half megawatts. Doesn't switch. Other pictures of containers all over the world. The, the one you saw before was uh, South Africa. This is Brazil. It's a very international business. It's intensive. We need to travel a lot. Um, and sometimes we get these customers with the annoying questions to have uh, like higher pressure, uh, which is an example, we will build in uh, compressors, so it's a high, highly engineered business. Uh, we're involved in a lot of RE projects, as we call them, RE and fueling stations. This map of Europe uh, represents it well, projects we've been involved to. Um, most of you will also recognize the logos of Linde, Air Liquide, uh, companies who are also very active in this uh, field and who use our equipment to build into a fueling station or into a power-to-gas application. I guess that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I hope I kept it in within my five minutes. Thank you very much. So we can pass the microphone on. Our next guest up on the stage is, check my list here. Carsten Krause, CEO of Areva. Welcome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will present you Areva H2Gen. But first about me. My name is Carsten Krause and I'm responsible for the German market. Areva H2Gen. Um, it's a new company built up in uh, 2014. We have three shareholders, Areva, Smart Energy and uh, Adem. So all together we have uh, 25 years of experience in the field of uh, electrolyzers. On one hand we have the power of Areva, it's a global player for energy. And on the other hand we have uh, the agility and reactivity of a small and medium enterprise with a target to become a global player in the market. Why was this joint venture last year? There was a technological, technological synergy between two companies. One company, CETH2, with the investor of uh, Smart Energy. And uh, the second player was Areva Helion. Both developed uh, PEM electrolyzers with different ways. Oh, this is... For example, Areva uh, had a focus of 50 bar technology, PEM electrolyzers. So this was a synergy to bring both together to have a new product for Areva H2Gen. The third player, the third uh, shareholder is ADEM. It's an energy agency of France who invest in uh, new technologies. We have three short-term objectives. One is to have, uh, in a real short-term objective, 240 norm cubic meter standard systems. Currently, we have a one, 120 system at 35 bar. Then, for the power-to-gas market, to have a modular flexible system 
And target three is to have a CAPEX system of 1,200 kilowatt. 1,200 euro a kilowatt. What does it look like? This is a full-size container. We have a plug-and-play solution. That means we have inside these containers, we have the, the whole system and um, also purification and all things. On the right-hand side, the purification for hydrogen. Here you can see inside, on the right-hand side, the gas grid, and on the left side, also PLC and the rectifier. On the back side, you see water purification, gas chiller. This is a whole system we produce in our, on our location, on our base in Paris, in the production side. And we test the whole system on our side, and then we deliver the whole system, the container, to our customer. We have three major markets, industry market, mobility, and renewable market, power to gas market. In the power to gas market, for example, our newest project is in uh, Bavaria in Germany. Um, just a few weeks ago, we delivered an electrolyzer. Here it is uh, integration into a, a solar grid solution with a lot of other partners. And uh, on the other hand, we not only have the electrolyzer, we have also a LOHC storage system here and um, integrated to store the hydrogen and this will deliver in uh, September and integrate. Now we have the electrolyzer in the grid and for the reconversion we have another partner. This is not uh, Areva technology but in this project it is another partner. As a summary, our advantages, we have a very high safety standard, industrial standard uh, system. We have a very efficient product, more than 70% on the whole system. We have a high reliability and we have a simple system with an easy maintenance and especially for the maintenance we have our partner Areva um, to bring it. Yeah, thank you very much for the listening. Thank you. So last but not least, uh, Bjorn Simonsen, who is, yeah, uh, approaching me. Uh, Bjorn Simonsen, Director in Market Development of NEL Hydrogen. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, the wrong... Uh... Do you need that? Yeah, yeah maybe. Uh, it's the... You see it? So I'm from a company called uh, Nell Hydrogen. We know hydrogen. We've been working with hydrogen since 1927. Then we were part of a company called Norsk Hydro. So we have 90 years of accumulated knowledge and experience and improvement of our electrolyzers. They work, they are efficient, and they are reliable. And that is why we are a preferred supplier for large-scale hydrogen production also today. Um, this uh, shows a picture from 30, 1930s. It's a 135 megawatt electrolyzer plant. 30,000 normal cubic meters of hydrogen per hour. It has been done before. And uh, we see that we can also do this again. Um, and Nell has gone through um, a series of, of uh, changes uh, during, during the 90 years of existence. Um, we have a heritage from Norsk Hydro with the atmospheric alkaline electrolyzers. We're taking that forward. And recently, as a part of becoming a public uh, listed company in Norway, we are moving into the fields of hydrogen refueling and energy storage as well, where we are taking our, our knowledge uh, and our, uh, our philosophy of large scale to these new markets. Actually, the reason we're entering these markets now 
is also that they are growing into our portfolio. And large scale is also the only way to really make a profit from these new markets. Um, <clears throat> the refueling station technology was both developed by Norsk Hydro, which set up the first, the world's first public refueling station in Iceland. I think it was in 2003 or 2004. Statoil, uh, an oil company in Norway, they also developed a hydrogen refueling station technology. They still operate today by a different company and they're some of the most reliable hydrogen refueling stations we have. So we take the technology from, from hydro and from Statoil and we're now developing a new hydrogen refueling station, a commercial grade refueling station which enables the owner to actually make money out of selling hydrogen. We're done with demonstration. Now it's time to move into the commercial market. And I think that's really important to acknowledge. And also that the products that we and our other um, suppliers are, are developing. When it comes to energy storage, uh, we also have a heritage in that area. Uh, Norsk Hydro, they set up the world's first power to gas system 10 years ago at uh, Utsira Island, an island off the west coast of Norway, where they produced hydrogen out of excess wind, stored it, used it again for electricity when the need was there. It has been demonstrated also, and now it's been being demonstrated in 30 some projects in Germany. So we know it works, but we need to take it to the next stage. We need to take it to the commercial stage. And that also takes me to uh, the, the next thing, the next really important thing for power to gas energy storage projects. You need a customer, you need someone to buy that hydrogen. And yes, we do have vehicles coming, a couple now, some more next year, hopefully a lot in 2020 and maybe enough in 2025. So I think it's important to also focus on the already existing markets, the already big consumers of hydrogen to make this uh, commercial. And that's where we are also going with, with our technology. Um, <clears throat> so um, briefly summarized, we, we, we have hydrogen in our, in our veins. It's, it's in our uh, blood. We have a, a heritage that we are building on and taking into, into new markets. So, um, and the good thing about this I'm number seven out of, of the, these uh, previous uh, competitors or collaborators, you might say. And the good thing about the market now is that the cake is growing. So even though everyone wants a piece of the cake, the whole cake is growing and that's uh, the good thing uh, moving forward. So thanks for the attention. Thank you. Could I invite all of our guests to uh, come back up on stage here so we can have a, um, a brawl or a conversation about these technologies? I hope everyone's still there. Looks like this. This conversation is a dialogue also with the public. Okay, if yeah. you can drag it out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you. So, um, of course, after you spoke um, uh, eloquently in that short time, I've just discovered we have more time now to talk. <laughs> so, um, we're going to open this uh, conversation to the floor as well uh, for questions. There's so many questions to ask, um, so many key issues. One of the issues that we've had uh, since 2004 here is when the cars are here, and that's always been this game between when is the infrastructure for the cars there. Uh, well, I've heard some interesting things here. We can start with the small and perhaps move up scale. It's very difficult to talk about this because when you talk about hydrogen, um, isn't it true that the majority of the customers these days are still industrial? It, would that be a general truth about, okay, and where we're moving, of course, is to hydrogen in a far larger scale as a consumer um, form of 
uh, transferring energy that would affect everyone. Oh, thank you for joining us. So let's start with the downscale applications here. We used to have this debate, uh, the cars, um, they're supposed to be delivered. We said this in 2004, we were expecting 50,000 or 100,000 automobiles, but now in this year we do have zero production of a hydrogen car. We still have the issue though of fueling stations. And what I heard today, one indication of a solution to a problem was, is there a potential for a mobile fueling station, I shouldn't say mobile, one that operates through sun energy or wind energy on site, pressurizes and allows you to refuel the cars. We get complaints about people trucking in energy to power up a small fleet because we say it's clean energy, but we deliver the energy with diesel fuel. So um, it, there is a paradox of uh, claiming it's clean fuel, but again, using conventional fuel to deliver that. Installing a grid is problematic for some people. Can we potentially use on-site production and refuel cars, cars, uh, cars with that technology? Any takers on the question? We'll, we'll run down the line. Okay. Okay, th uh, thanks for the question. So our whole proposition really at ITM is, is for producing fuel for vehicles on site so that there's no carbon footprint in the transportation of the fuel. Uh, you talked about direct coupling to renewable power. Again, uh, this is a rather elegant thing to do. Um, your electrolyzer needs to respond very rapidly on and off with the fluctuations of renewables. And again, that's a particular emphasis in what we do at ITM is, is rapid response and direct coupling to renewable power. We've coupled directly to uh, wind and to solar. We look at maximum power point tracking of electrolyzers with solar energy. It's a particular issue in California. Mm -hmm. um, our first refueling station on the M1 in the UK is directly connected to a wind turbine. So um, it is a big emphasis of ours, on-site generation of hydrogen to get the absolute lowest carbon footprint. Well, what I think it comes down to is uh, money talks. Uh, and in this early phase, uh, and uh, also in the future, I think we'll see a, a mix between on-site uh, generation and centralized uh, hubs uh, of producing hydrogen and then transporting it to to the, to the station. Of course, the most important thing is where does the hydrogen come from? Obviously, we're all electrolyzer companies, so we all agree it comes from electricity mm -hmm. and preferably renewable. But I think that's where you have to, to uh, really uh, answer to, to the critics of this. But, but I definitely believe in, in, a, in a mixed, uh, mixed option because uh, on-site production, yeah, it, it's good. You eliminate the, the transport to, to, to the station, but then again, it needs to be uh, price competitive. And also in the build-up of an infrastructure, it will be greatly underutilized, which means so will your electrolyzer. So in that sense, it's, it's, there's a sweet spot somewhere in between, I think. Yeah, I also agree that there will be a mixture between on-site uh, production and um, we see the, for, for the on-site production, we see not the whole mobility part. I guess uh, there will be a focus on, uh, for example, on um, bus fueling stations. Mm -hmm. So we know or we expect uh, in the next years larger bus fleets and if you have a bus fleet of 5, 10 or 15 buses and you need 20, uh, 200 kilograms a day then it's stupid to, to, to bring it in uh, with a trailer. So there you need an on-site uh, production and uh, I guess this is, these are the, the hydrogen stations we see the first step now next year or in the next two years where we have the on-site production. Well, um, most of the hydrogen today is like, we're talking 95, 96% of all hydrogen in, the, in this world is coming out of natural gas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason is simple, it's cost. It's the cheapest hydrogen available. Uh, natural gas is a very good uh, hydrogen carrier. But it's also dirty, it's, it's a dirty technology. You, you produce hydrogen and uh, you breathe like tons of CO2 
in that process, CO2 that is getting into the atmosphere. Using that hydrogen to fill up your cars, you're not solving the problem, you're just shifting it. That's, that's, that's what it comes down to. So I guess it's a no-brainer that hydrogen has to be generated by electrolysis. It has to come Long from time, yeah. clean electricity, so obviously renewable energy, going into electrolysis and ultimately find its way to the fuel tank. Now, these days, hydrogen cars are fueled often with this so-called dirty hydrogen. On itself, it's not too bad as long as this will make it possible that, that cars get deployed. And we see encouraging signs. Finally, there are cars available, let's say, close to a good commercial price. So it's okay, it will be an intermediate stage, but ultimately it will have to go on site with electrolysis. I, I don't know what I can add here. Uh, okay, so what, what I think, uh, green er, hydrogen really has a, a future there. We, we need actually to, to get to this new paradigm with hydrogen. So finding synergies in this energy sector. And I think this will be the more difficult there. So to combine electricity, the gas sector, and also industrial sector there to find a new paradigm there. So I think that's where I, we should strive to. And the core technology there will be electrolysis. So I think electrolysis really has a chance there. Yeah. I'm pretty with uh, my previous colleagues, uh, the same idea. <clears throat> Today we have the big chance uh, to move uh, the consumption of uh, fuel coming from uh, petrol and carbon uh, fuel to a brand new technology thanks to the hydrogen. We can avoid uh, completely pollution due to carbon. So it's very important uh, that all the people understand uh, the efforts that all these companies are making in order to get uh, a clean world, a green world, and, and that's the target uh, of uh, um, the people who understand that uh, when they use the car, there is always a mass of uh, uh, CO2, NOx, SOx that they inject into the into uh, the atmosphere with the, with the hydrogen technology. This would be practically. Tell me if it is not correct. Maybe 99.6669999 percent uh, uh, steam. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at uh, self production of uh, hydrogen from uh, green energy photovoltaic, uh, uh, hydroelectric, geo, uh, thermal uh, power system or heolic system in order to continue the startup of the European Union and all the other countries which invested much money on uh, feeding tariffs and stuff like that in order to make the big uh, jump on the on the business and uh, on the on the sheep of uh, of the new uh, energy uh, conception. I heard one word uh, repeated here. I think four times in total, and that's grid stabilization. I wanted to move on to that topic because there's always been a danger in this industry. We've seen it here since 2004. Uh, the boutique issue is the car because they look so damn cool and because engineers want cars. Everyone talks about cars, uh, but when we talk about the larger energy grid, we're an entirely different level there because no one anticipates we're going to sell a million hydrogen cars in the next three or four years. It's just not going to happen. It'd be nice, but it won't happen. Grid stabilization, though, affects the way we use energy right now. We are currently using coal, even in Germany. Um, we are dependent upon natural gas uh, to stabilize the grid. Um, and the issues there are fast starting. Um, uh, for example, this is an entirely new demand basically placed on these technologies. It's always interesting uh, for me to note, isn't this an entirely new way of um, uh, thinking about what we're doing with hydrogen technologies? Grid stabilization 
just the intricacy, what it involves, quick reaction times, and so on. So what new challenges do we see there? It's an old technology. You've been around for 90 years. You look a lot younger. What are the new challenges that are being um, raised by the issue of grid stabilization? Any takers? Okay, Bjorn? So, um, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you will disagree with me, but uh, I think uh, for a grid operator, what he will do, he will go for the cheapest option first. And what the, the grid operator and the customer wants, they want electricity. So they'll do everything in their power to, to avoid uh, going into to producing hydrogen, at least as a frequency grid stabilization control. And we'll probably see that uh, uh, they will get very far with, with batteries and maybe also with, with flow cells. Uh, and, um, and then I think at the end of the day, it's the energy uh, storage, as you say, which will be the important thing. But then again, who, who, who will buy this uh, energy you've stored as hydrogen? And then I think the key is politics, money, money politics. And the, the, the way I think we as a, as a market, as, as electrolyzer manufacturers can survive and thrive and really take it to the next level is to start eating into those 95% that are now uh, held by the natural gas oil uh, refineries. Uh, and if we can manage that, one more percent of that will double our present market. So I think it's really important to work with, with politics to make sure that renewable hydrogen gets a place into the, the, the traditional industries, uh, chemical industry and refineries. Then we will see a, a really nice, nice uh, rise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Great. So um, uh, grid balancing and energy storage are both absolutely massive markets. I, I, I don't agree that batteries will be a, a, um, a solution for energy storage or for grid balancing. I think I worked for many, many years, 25 years in energy storage, developing batteries, developing flow cells. I built the largest flow cell ever built, 100 megawatt hours at Little Barford in the UK. They're all limited because they produce electricity. What you have to do is take the excess electricity and export it out of the power industry somewhere else. That's why you use power to gas energy storage. With an electrolyzer, you buy kilowatts, okay, and you store the kilowatt hours in the gas grid, which you already own. So it's by far the longest term energy storage yep. and the lowest cost energy storage when it comes to pounds per kilowatt hour. Okay, so you buy the power part, you don't need to buy the energy storage part because you already own it. It's called the gas grid. And you also decarbonize the gas grid by putting renewable hydrogen into it. Um, we don't see disinterest in power to gas energy storage from power companies and gas companies. We've seen massive traction. Every power company that we talk to is, is interested in this subject. And they're interested in it because we have a flexible load that can respond in less than two seconds. So it gives you primary uh, grid balancing. And it also gives you energy storage that's long term, not short term. A battery gives you an hour. A flow cell gives you three hours. Hydrogen gives you thousands of hours a year. It's an entirely different proposition. Mm -hmm. And it also gives you renewable heat. Yes, I totally agree. And uh, for Germany, we see it, it's a growing market. Now we have 27% renewable, mm -hmm. and uh, 2030 we have 60%, and uh, 2050 about 80. Well, I don't know. We don't know yet, but uh, we, we think to have this. And uh, so it's a growing market, so it's necessary to start now. And I totally agree with you. And I guess now it's very important for the next two, three, four years. Uh, not only to have this power to gas projects and to, to bring the hydrogen into the grid, uh, it, it's great also to show um, that uh, it's, with hydrogen you can do more and, and you have a project, power to gas, maybe combined with a fueling station uh, and to use it in a fuel cell or and to use it in a car and this to demonstrate. So then you are not in a competition with a battery. So if you use the hydrogen uh, on site also for, for a bus fleet or for cars, then uh, it's no competition to a battery. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a 
discuss, sorry to take the mic again, there was a discussion about the underutilization of the electrolyzer in the early days of a vehicle rollout. Mm -hmm. Actually, what you do is you combine power to gas energy storage, which utilizes the electrolyzer significantly, and you combine that with refueling. In that case, you get the maximum use of the electrolyzer and you provide energy that's exported from the electricity network into two sectors. One's the gas sector and the other is the fuel sector. Well, um, I guess it's also here a no-brainer because uh, we see an increased injection of uh, renewable power into the grid. This is causing the grid, uh, this is causing stability problems on yeah, the grid. Yeah. Yeah. Today, uh, utility companies can still manage, uh, but for those of you who are not very familiar with this, a grid is the best logistical operation in the world. Uh, as much as go in must come out immediately. You can't store any energy on that grid. So this reflects, you could see it, it's a free market. Uh, this reflects in the pricing. Sometimes there's excess power offered for one reason or another. It could be that the wind is blowing a bit harder than anticipated. These guys are masters in planning. But if there is excess power, where to go to, right? And that power is sometimes even offered at negative prices. In other words, you're being paid to, to take out that excess power. Mm -hmm. Now, what an electrolyzer is doing is basically converting energy. It's transforming this kilowatt hours, as you were correctly stating, into kilograms, something tangible, something you can store. You cannot store kilowatt hours. You can do it in a battery, you can do it in a laptop, you can do it in a car, but not much more than that. Um, so this is a big market, obviously. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to add, it, it is in fact a, a big market. The three issues I see there, uh, it's first the cost of the technology. Technology is there, it's reliable. We, mm -hmm. we built it since a long time, so we have it available. But we still get, need to get to this curve to reduce this cost there. Uh, the second one is uh, legislation, so it should be adapted in, in order to uh, allow this increased penetration of uh, hydrogen actually on the energy markets area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm agreeing uh, with um, what uh, Mr. Cooley was saying before. Um, today we have uh, the uh, possibility to become producing ourselves the energy and this is a, a revolution in the mind of the people a revolution in the world because we are used to purchase a fuel we are used to see just few supplier of uh, the main and most important product that the people in the world are is using so the question mark will be are we allowed that somebody will tell us anything that uh, some some difficulties will be put uh, in terms of uh, we said before politics uh, uh, in order to uh, get uh, this democracy of uh, energy. This is the question mark and uh, we are not uh, on the side able to uh, say yes, uh, we, we can do or we cannot do, but uh, we, we can, all of us I think agree, we can say that if today we are at this stage of the technology, in three years, it will be totally revol uh, re revolutioned technology, and in th five years, it will be much more performant, and so on and so on. So, uh, as we saw for other technology, especially PV market, PV photovoltaic plants, we saw a decrease, tremendous decrease of on price, and uh, we will see the same thing. Uh, we feel that we will see the same thing uh, in the next uh, five years uh, uh, for the hydrogen market. No one's stepping on anyone's toes here, and I was expecting more of a brawl, so I'm going to have to ask at least one provocative question. Come on, guys. I'm on the stage regularly. People talk about mass production of hydrogen, and then they raise the question, where are we going to store it? Sure, there are salt mines. You can fill them full. What are you going to do with it? And here's the question. 
the grid can only absorb up to 10% before it gets corrosive. That is, you can't just dump it into the natural gas grid. We know this. You can store it, but then you have to reconvert it. Then there's issues of, fish, of, of efficiency. So we're still looking for the optimal way to use this technology. And in fact, the limitation to all your business models is not that there's not enough renewables. It's what happens after you get through with the electrolysis. And I think it is a little bit of an illusion to say, oh, we'll just dump it into the natural gas grid and things will be, it doesn't work that way. So there are alternatives and here's a discussion. Part of your business model should be to talk about how we're going to add carbon to that hydrogen molecule and feed it into the natural gas grid or are we going to develop a technology that's going to be installed in people's houses? Why are we talking about the large grid anyway? Why aren't we talking about decentralized grids? Because this decentralized grid is a way to use the production of hydrogen locally instead of bowing to the large grid, which is just a historical product. It may not be necessary whatsoever. It may be to our disadvantage to think that, because that's how we got here. We're importing natural gas. All of the energy that we require in this per capita number one exporting country in the world, it's imported. So um, it's got us into this predicament. So I'm basically asking the question, isn't it a bit of an, uh, um, uh, well, it's not deceptive, but let's be honest, we have to think about what to do post hydrolysis. So yeah, who's gonna, <laughs> Bjorn, yeah. Give me some feedback, Bjorn, come on. I, I think again, the, the key here is the customer. Who will buy that hydrogen? I mean, even if we could inject 100% hydrogen in the natural gas grid, there would be someone that would have to be a customer uh, that would actually want to buy that hydrogen. So I think we, we're, we're not looking enough at the 95% of the market. Well, the the customer, everyone needs that's electricity key, anyway. That's, that's uh, where, where one of the keys to, to, yeah. to realizing that, that the full market potential lies. And mm -hmm. with 10%, uh, we... We, that's a quite a lot of hydrogen, actually. It is, if yeah. we can inject 10% in the European gas grid, uh, we'll all be very rich and, and uh, all companies 10 times larger than we are presently, I, yeah. I, I think we could say. So, so I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say that's a limiting factor now in the, in the early stage. I mm. think then the limiting factor now is, is legislation and, and green credits for, for hydrogen. That's what really will make this... this this market uh, past the tipping point, I think. Thank you. So if we got to the 10% limit in Europe, we'd all be sipping pina coladas on the beach somewhere. I mean, that 10% in the gas grid is a huge amount of energy. Look, in the UK, we have 350 terawatt hours flowing through the electricity grid. We have 1,000 terawatt hours flowing through the gas grid. Okay, 10% of that is a market towards 100 billion for electrolyzers, and that's just in the UK. It really is a massive market. You said when you get to a certain level, it becomes corrosive in the gas grid. Incorrect. We used to have a 60% hydrogen gas grid in the UK when we worked on town gas. Mm. Actually, the limit to hydrogen in the gas grid is flame speed. Okay, so when we changed from a hydrogen-based grid to a methane-based grid in the UK, the gas company had to go around and change everyone's burners. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that hydrogen has a slightly higher flame speed than methane does. So we stay below the Dutton limit. And that limit is between 12 and 15% hydrogen okay. mm -hmm. in the gas grid. Then the gas looks identical to the customer. Okay, absolutely identical. The only difference is that the gas we put in doesn't have any carbon in it. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is using the gas grid as an energy store for renewable energy and you're decarbonizing the gas grid. Okay, you said that you have to reconvert back. Actually, yeah. actually, more than half of all of the gas in the UK and of course in Germany and most of Europe does not go back to power generation, it's used for heat. Yeah. It's used for domestic and industrial heat. So when you do power to gas energy storage, you're providing renewable heat mm -hmm. and you're exporting the energy from the electricity network mm -hmm. into a different sector, that's the heat sector. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the numbers are very, very large. But the, the idea that you can't run a gas grid with high levels of hydrogen, well, actually, 
old, older gas grids did exactly that. Doesn't it require any retubing to do that, though? Because I hear the people from uh, Linda telling me you can't just dump uh, endless quantities of natural ga of uh, hydrogen into a natural gas grid. It, it's only the burner that you have to change. That's your claim. No, that's that's not right. Lots of studies done on this. Naturally high is probably the best one to look at, mm -hmm. which was an EU study. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you get to very high levels of hydrogen, the only problem you have is in the transmission network, okay, which is based on steel, and it's the welds that are the issue. Mm -hmm. Actually, you don't inject into the distribute into the transmission network. Mm -hmm because all of the customers are in the distribution network and that's where you put the hydrogen. And there aren't any issues to do with steel welds in the distribution network. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that's the way that you operate. And of course, gas never goes uphill. So you can continue to have a trans gas transmission network that's international with imports and exports and put the hydrogen into the bounded, so the closed system, which is the distribution network which is what everybody's doing today in power to gas. Okay, I totally agree that 10% uh, is a large, uh, large, <laughs> large amount for, for the storage in the grid. On the other hand, you have other options. Uh, in Germany, we think about or we have projects uh, to, for cavern storage, for seasonal uh, storage for the hydrogen. And uh, secondly, there's, there's uh, another huge market you already mentioned, the industry, uh, where especially in Germany, we have a, a large uh, chemical industry and uh, they're using hydrogen now, not, not green hydrogen yet, but it could be an option. And yeah, the third way is the fuel cells or other cars, but it's not this amount we, we speak now about. I think I have to put the statement from ITM being in doubt because uh, the energy density of the gas will, will be lower with hydrogen. There have been uh, studies uh, carried on on this. Uh, it would maybe not have an impact on, on the network itself, but they, they will have to adopt a lot of equipment on this uh, network there. So what I think is direct use of hydrogen, this is also a solution. So you, you have power to gas, this is one of solu the way to go, but using the hydrogen directly, I think you can get way more value out of it there. And there are many streams you can follow there actually, even on the industrial side. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. When, when I look to the size of the companies who are presenting here, they are all in the limit of a few hundred people. And when we look back uh, three years ago, for example, there was very little talking about storing the hydrogen in the grid, in the gas grid, for example. That came up in the last two years. And it is very explosive. Uh, this year, is mo many presentations are on this topic. And do you have the power to grow uh, with this growing market? Well, I have to say that my company is not that big as my colleague company. We are pretty small. We are not more than 22 people. And, but uh, yes, you're right. You're right. Uh, the, the business is, uh, I don't say exploding, because with hydrogen is not a word to say, but uh, it's, it's rising very, very quick. So we trust on it, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone comes in the growth? Well, um, I, I don't consider that as a problem needed. Uh, I guess um, growing is, 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 is like, uh, that's a luxury problem. Uh, um, the way we are set up, I, I showed you some pictures of, of, of the workshop we have. We could theoretically use the same premises and already triple the output we have today without doing spending much money on overhead. Well, surely we will have to invest in people. Um, but I don't see I, I don't see upscaling as a problem here. Um, I guess. I, I think the challenge now lies in that the only commercial market presently is industry. 
uh, both hydrogen refueling and, and uh, powered gas energy storage is very political. It's project by project. So what we need to do, because now we've demonstrated both that the hydrogen refueling stations, they work. The hydrogen cars work. Power to gas works. Uh, you can do frequency control. You can do uh, all of this, uh, all of these uh, good things with with the uh, with the equipment. So now is the time to go to the commercial uh, to show the commercial viability, and then we might enter such uh, luxury problems with with uh, production capacity within our own uh, boundaries. And 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 that's why I again emphasize. I think it's so important to to try to grow within also the existing hydrogen markets, to use uh, the new technology for the existing markets, to, to have the chance to really get a boost. The big boosts within, within my own company, they came with these huge plants. With, with the first 130 megawatt plant, there was a very uh, big amount of funds that went into improving the technology and lowering the costs. And the same thing was for the second uh, plant of the same size. So I think once we, we get to big, big scale, then we will also see, see, see the price coming down. But the challenge now is to move into commercial stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th uh, thanks for the question, a very good question. They are massive markets. And uh, when you address a massive market, there's a need for working capital. Actually, a, a number of the companies on this stage are, are publicly traded companies, including my own. So we have to be careful what to say. But I, I over the last year, I've uh, uh, met many, many companies interested in investing in this sector. And in fact, recently we took on a five million investment from a strategic partner for the very reason you're talking about, and that is for expansion and for manufacturing. So good question, I really agree with you. I think the answer really is that these small companies you see in front of you could potentially be really huge one day. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to cap. It's unfortunate. We're running out of time. Our next guest is um, already chomping at the bit, as we say, um, and waiting for his chance on the stage. This has been incredibly informative. Um, just a brief recap uh, and reminder, again, since 2004, um, everyone knows the electrolysis issue. Uh, it, the technology's been there. But look at this. This has become a focal issue because uh, these technologies, and I mean all of them, all of the fuel technologies are advancing apace and we're getting to the point where large-scale implementation is going to be important as well as the issues of energy supply and the grid all of these are being addressed so you're playing a fundamental role it's great to have you all here I'd like to thank all of my guests Raymond Schmidt uh, territory manager of Proton on site Tristan Kretschmer who had to go uh, but he was here for his speech sales manager of McPhi energy Dr. Graham Cooley CEO of um, ITM power and Royal de Mayer Hydro Hydrogenics, sorry, <laughs> and um, um, Mauro Gregori, sales manager at CTS, and Karsten Krause, CAO um, of, um, um, of Areva Hygen, I left that out the first time, I'm sorry, around. and Bjorn Simonson, of course, uh, director of uh, market development at Nell Hydrogen. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a fantastic conversation.